Horror is a piece of media that we as humans can't seem to get enough of. Whether it's TV media, video games, or telling your friends a spooky story around the campfire, we can't seem to get enough of it. And what better way to experience horror through the interactive media of video games. But recently, in the video games industry, we have seemed to run into a bit of a dry spout for horror. Which is why when I saw the announcement trailer for Still Wakes the Deep back in June of 2023, I was instantly hyped. Knowing that there would be a horror game set on an oil rig, which let's face it is already inherently creepy, and then knowing that that game would also be coming to console was enough for me to say, yeah, I'm buying that. Am I your type? Um, I'd do it. Oh yeah, I might want to add in that the gameplay and art design looked really cool too. <laughs> Nice. So I waited and waited, watching every trailer that dropped and even commenting on some trailer videos, telling the devs how excited I was for the game and how good the game looked, and also to keep up the good work. I did all this watching, waiting, and even talking about the game until, finally, the game dropped. And then I got a little bit annoyed that it didn't release on Xbox disc yet, but still, nonetheless, I bought the game and was ready to play. Without delay, let me tell you, my experience was still wakes the deep in today's ultimate review. In this video, I want to go over every single part of this game and analyze it in great detail. That all starts with the main menu screen. Yeah, man, I meant it when I said every single part of this game. This is not no IGN review. IGN picked Fallout 3 as its game of the year back in 2008. Two years later, we have Fallout New Vegas, but it often feels like a giant expansion for Fallout 3 rather than an all-new game. This is definitely still a wasteland worth exploring. I can hear you all asking, Truth, why are we bothering with the main menu screen? We want to hear about the gameplay and the story, Truth. The response to that would be, yeah, well, shut up. Believe it or not, the main menu is not only incredibly important for setting up first impressions with the player, but it also counts as a part of the game. So, I'm going over it. The main menu for a horror game, and well, any game, should do a few things. Those things being, one, the main menu itself needs to be simple to navigate and easy to use. Number two, what's being displayed on the main menu should give you an overall vibe and feeling about the game you're about to play. What I'm trying to say is it should tell you something about the game you're going to play without actually telling you something about the game you're going to play, if that makes sense. Still Wakes the Deep's main menu screen is simple but effective. You can see the North Sea and behind it the shadow of the oil rig you're going to be on throughout the game. To the left you have the game's title in large text and under that all the options on the main menu screen. The game's main menu screen is easy to follow and easy to understand. Everything you need is in pure view and if you want to tweak any options you know exactly how to do it. The atmosphere of the title screen is quiet, like too quiet, and you can hear the waves in the water and that's all you can hear, along with the large intimidating oil rig in the background. In my opinion, this is a perfect main menu screen. It's simple to use and easy to understand, and the atmosphere screams what the game is trying to portray. Still Wakes the Deep starts with a slow pan into the oil rig whilst a woman is monologuing in the background. Still can't believe you went. What are you thinking? Going to that place. Wish you hadn't got yourself into this mess, but you did. The woman talks about how she can't believe that you went, and how she's tired of running, and that she wants this to be over. Can you run forever? It's clear she's talking to the player here, and don't worry, if you didn't pick that up, it's fine, because she says the player's name about 10 seconds later. No, please, Cass. The monologue ends with the woman saying she won't wait for him, and that the girls made him a Christmas card. I just want it to be over you home, the girls want you home, but if you don't deal with this, then we are done for good. I love you, but I won't wait forever. Jesus, Sus. Girls need your Christmas card. <laughs> We then get our first F-bomb of the game, which helps me make no money or as little money as possible off of this video. So thank you, the Chinese room. Sus. Girls need your Christmas card. Oh. Ah, fuck. And there's no money in here! <laughs> the 
camera then cuts to a first person perspective, where we see our protagonist, Kaz, sitting on a bed inside the oil rig, reading a letter which was the same monologue being said at the start of the game. From this letter we can find out quite a few things, for example we can infer that the letter given to Kaz is from his wife. The woman mentions girls, which implies that Kaz and this woman have had children together. Home. The, girls won't be home. the woman, or Kaz's wife, also seems quite upset or even confused why Kaz has gone to, quote, that place. Where you went? What are you thinking? Going to that place? Wish you hadn't got yourself into this mess, but you did. Referring to, of course, what we can assume is the oil rig, she also mentions that Kaz is running away. Can you run forever? Which could imply that there's a deeper meaning to why Kaz is on this oil rig in the first place that we the player don't know yet. We find out quite a lot from this letter, but it also leaves quite a lot to be desired. Kaz is called through for breakfast by one of his crewmates, and it's at this point in the game where we're given full control over him. And what's this? He has legs and a torso and shoulders? Right, stop the review. Give the game a 10 out of 10 right now. the minute, we're in the cabin section of the oil rig, and it's at this point in the game where, like I say, we're given full control to explore. We can go into different crewmates' cabins and really see what they're like. And I gotta say, this is a really unique way of getting to know different characters' personalities without actually interacting with them. Before I talk about other crewmates' rooms, let's talk about Kaz's. You can interact with a couple things in the room, such as a picture that what we can assume was drawn by Kaz's children, and the letter that Kaz just read, in case you want to read it again. We interact with the radio, but it says about as much as Joe Biden on a good day. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him... Uh, foot, foot. Looking on Kaz's walls, we can see a picture of a young boxer, who we can assume was Kaz when he was younger. We can also see on the side of Kaz's window a few pictures of a woman likely Sue, the woman who wrote the letter to Kaz, Kaz's wife. If you're wondering why there's tinsel everywhere, why don't you take your own sensible guess? In the cabin opposite Kaz's, you can find a letter addressed to who I can only assume is Trotz. Aye, quite right, Trotz. The states that the oil rig does not meet with regular standard for safety. The letter seems very important, as it's sent from the North Sea Oil Workers Union. By the way, I looked this up, and they were a real, and are a real union, who look out for North Sea oil rig workers. Basically, what I'm saying is there's about a 1% chance that this really actually happened. The letter ends quite seriously, saying, We urge you to engage with us and resolve our valid dispute. This to me at least says in leaps and bounds that the oil rig does have some issues. Some issues that the overseer of the oil rig or the owner of the oil rig clearly doesn't want to address. I uh, hope this doesn't become a problem later on in the game for our protagonist. The letter also states the year that the game takes place, that year being 1974. We visit many other cabins, but there's not really much to note down of significance other than the fact that one of the cabins is flooded, Proving that the oil rig is not quite up to the standard it should be. Then the only other cabin I'll bring up is uh, the one with a uh, person who shares quite colourful opinions, I'll just say. On the way to the cafeteria, Kaz runs into a woman called Finley. She's a maintenance worker and is currently fixing a pipe. Alright Kaz! I'm alright. What are you doing up there? Pipes leaking! If it's not one thing, it's the other. He informs Kaz that Rainick, the overseer of the oil rig, is very angry and wants to see him as he's got a letter from mainland regarding Kaz that, let's just say, hasn't made him too pleased. Speaking of, you are in the shite, wee man. Rainick got a letter this morning from the mainland and he's been up to high dough ever since. Heard he's gunning for you. Well, that's just brilliant. Finley also mentions that the oil rig, like as we could see before, is pretty much falling apart, and mentions one name that we haven't heard before, Kadal. F***ing Kadal, and f***ing Rennick, cutting corners. Aye. Kadal is the name of the company that oversees many of the oil rigs in the North Sea off the coast of Scotland. Oh yeah, just in case you couldn't tell, this game set off the coast of Scotland. As you pass through the shower room, where of course nothing of any interest happens whatsoever, you can get to the cafeteria. Once you enter the canteen, you can speak to your fellow crewmates who are already sat down eating. There are three tables you can interact with. The closest one to the door has three men on it. The main man speaking is Trotz, talking about how the workers need to unite and stand together to take action before the oil rig gets worse and the conditions of safety are worsened. And Kadal are just going to make more cuts to get other rigs on the go. 
If we don't take industrial action soon, this place... Oh, come on! If we don't take industrial action soon, this place will be even more of a death trap than it already is. The middle table has two men sat at it, Brody and Ralph. Ralph, who sounds like he's 20 but looks like he's 40, is going on his first dive today and is a bit nervous. So our likeable main character, Kaz, tries to say some words of reassurance. Ah, you'll be alright, pal. Especially with the big man here looking out for you. Have you done it before? Christ, no. I'll stick to the lecky, thanks. No great in tight spaces and it's blowing a gale out there. Really filling the lad with confidence there. The final table you can interact with only has one man sat at it. The same man who shares some quite interesting political opinions. And when you interact with him, he mocks you and is pretty rude. Great. Really great to see one of the only British people in the game get some fantastic representation. Really doing us proud. Once you've interacted or spoken to all the three tables, you can go over to the main chef, Roy. However, before you get a chance to actually speak to him, an angry voice shouts for you over the intercom. McClary, to my office. That means now, not as soon as you're ready, now. It's here where we learn a bit more about what Rendrick, the overseer of the oil rig, might want to talk to McCleary about. Just to make things clear from this point onwards, the main character, the person you play as, is called Cameron McCleary, but people call him Kaz for short, so I'm going to call him Kaz for most of the game. But if you hear me say Cameron or McCleary, it's still the main character I'm talking about. When speaking to Roy, Kaz mentions the police. Ah, the sweet sound of Davy Rennick. You think it's the police? You think it's the police? The two men talk about this incident that Kaz had with the police for a minute or two, and we get the sense that these two men bond and connect on a deeper level than other crewmates with Kaz. As Roy almost seems like this older brother or uncle to Kaz, Roy mentions that Kaz beat someone up, which we can imply is why the police were involved, which we can also further imply is why Kaz might not want to work on mainland and might be more comfortable working on an oil rig off the North Sea. Get the jail she won. Well, maybe you could have considered that while you were battering Billy Chamberlain's head in. Slagged off Susie, had it coming. And For the first time in the game, Kaz is told by Roy that maybe he should just face this incident and go back to mainland. Listen mate, even if it is the police, maybe it's best to just go back and face it. As what likely happened was that Kaz beat someone up. We can back this theory up by the fact he's a boxer and he's referenced in this same chat as a boxer. We can also back this up by the fact that he says that the person he beat up was slagging off his wife. To avoid any charges being firmly placed on him or getting jail time, he probably fled the mainland of Scotland to work on an oil rig. Once you get to the deck of the oil rig, you can take in the view and you'll see just how beautiful this game really looks. The game's art is completely charming and everything about the game's art is amazing. Everything is so high detail and the world feels so real thanks to the art team behind the game. However, I need to address the elephant in my playthrough. It's at this point where I started to notice something a bit strange, a bit annoying. It seemed like every time I turned my character, there was a massive blur that went with it. And this is because the game puts on motion blur when you start the game. Now, after a lot of thinking about this in my head and going over it with myself, I can say that yes, you should play Still Wakes the Deep with motion blur on. It makes the whole game feel a lot more chaotic and realistic and just a lot more desperate overall where you're looking and everything's blurry and you can't quite see what's going on. However, if you're someone who absolutely can't stand motion blur, that's fine because there's an option to turn it off straight away. Hi. Damn, this game looks really good though. Uh, what's this? Uh, 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 is that motion blur? Get the anyway, back to the art. The game's art is great. Whether you're in the dark, creepy, flooded legs of the oil rig, or whether you're outside on the dangerous and windy deck of the oil rig, the game's art is beautiful, pleasing to look at, and overall fits the world's environment and atmosphere perfectly. But to be honest, there was no doubt in my mind that the art wasn't going to look great when it's made with Unreal Engine. Anyway, back to the game. You're moving through the deck, and Rainix seems to be getting more and more impatient with you. No, he loves it. Clearly, my office. I don't make me ask again. In a better mood today, is he? It'll be all right, guys. As you move through the main deck, you can see just how near dysfunctional the whole rig is. To top this off, when passing the main drilling section, you can be told that the drill is playing up. Well, oh boy, I sure hope this doesn't cause any issues. Ah, drill's acting up this morning. Got the crew running around like blue ass flies, but they cannot make head or tail of it. 
Before getting on the lift to go see Rainick, you're asked by one of your fellow crewmates if you can fix a fuse box. If you're unaware, Kaz is an electrician on the oil rig. The fix is simple and satisfying, and as the player, you get to click just a few buttons to have it done. Heading up to the top of the elevator, and you can find Rainick in his office building above all the workers below. Rainick is a small man with a short fuse and no patience whatsoever. He demands that Kaz immediately sit down in front of him, and then goes on to confirm that Roy is in fact one of Kaz's good friends. Master McClary, so glad you could join me, and sorry to have got you out of bed. Shut the door and have a seat. No, I'm fine, Stan. The set your ass in that chair, you fucking liability. But I don't... I run a tight ship. Do you understand me? A tight ship. Technically, it's no shit. Shut your gub, you Ned prick! I am sick, sick to fucking bookin' of you wee gobshites messing with my operation. That chef might be a mate of yours, but he does not run things around here. I do. Do you understand me? That chef might be a mate of yours. Rainick flies off the walls at Kaz, and it's at this point we can see that the man has an extremely high ego. You might be the height of shite on shore, McClary, but out here... I am the fucking king. Do you understand me? Rainick clearly feels like he is the most important and the most powerfulest person on this oil rig. He is extremely annoyed that Kaz has caused the police to inquire about him. You bring the police to my door? To my rig? Uh, look, I, I can sort this, right? I just need time. Shut it, you clatty gobshite. Rainick, as the overseer of the oil rig, probably doesn't want police around it because they'll find that the oil rig does not meet the regular safety standards that it should. Rainick gets a phone call from the drill operators, telling him that they need to stop drilling as something doesn't feel right. I'm in a meeting. What? For fuck's sake, Gibbo, I don't care. We're on a schedule. It's a fucking drill. You've got a fucking drill, so drill through it. However, unfortunately, egotistical Rainick demands that they keep drilling now. He's not having any of it and wants them to drill straight through whatever's in their way. Well, Roper's a whiny old fud. He's got a problem with everything. I don't care if it feels off. Just fucking do it or I'll come down there myself. Rainick puts the phone down and it's at this point he fires Kaz right there on the spot. You're fired. You hear me? Fire. Come on, man. It's only a wee bit of trouble with the polish. I'm good with the lecky. I keep things running. You said it yourself. Ouch! Get off my rig! Kaz tries to plead with Rainick, however, to no avail. So if I were to sum that conversation up in a few words, I'd say it's like an angry Fortnite child when he doesn't get his V-Bucks. Kaz slowly walks to the helipad to leave the rig, where he says to himself that there's no more running away for him, confirming that he was running away in the first place from his problems. However, when you get to the helipad, the whole oil rig begins to shake and a loud bang can be heard in the distance. Strange splodges appear at the side of Kaz's vision and then he sees one of his fellow crewmates fall off the rig. Kaz does everything in his power to save the man, however, the man ends up falling off the rig into the North Sea below. And then, suddenly, another explosion can be heard in the distance which once again shakes the oil rig, leading to Kaz to fall off as well. When Kaz falls off the oil rig, he seems to have some sort of hallucination slash flashback. We then get a full-on flashback where we can barely make out Sue, Kaz's wife, talking to Roy, which of course confirms that Roy and Kaz were good friends even before the oil rig. It's clear that this conversation is set after Kaz beat up the man who talked badly about Sue. I had a word with Akira, you remember him? He knows Billy Chamberlain from way back. Owes me a favour. 
Reckons you can sweeten Billy up a bit. Come on. Have I ever let you down? It appears that Roy is trying to convince Kaz's wife, Sue, that he should come with him on the oil rig for just four months for work. But perhaps if you went to the Saracens a little less and the Tabernacle a little more, then perhaps you'd not be in this pickle, eh? Don't, don't look at me. You're the one who decided to spend the next four months trapped on our egg with this bad pot. The flashback ends with Roy promising Sue that he will sort things out, and then the flashback ends abruptly. Susan, I promise you, I promise you, we will get this straightened out. I will. You'd better. <laughs> Kaz wakes up to a scene of complete and utter panic. We can see crewmates around him trying to get him to someplace warm after falling into that deep, cold ocean. Guys! Christ! He's got cold! Shit! Guys! Get his leg! We can't leave him out here! Move! The men, still in panic, question whether or not Kaz will truly wake up and respond to them. Kaz lets out a cough, and then the screen fades to black. We can't, Kaz! Why is he not waking up? Can you hear me? Is he going to die, Brody? <laughs> Kaz? <laughs> when Kaz finally properly wakes up, we can see he's been left in a room with a heater beside him to keep him warm after falling into that treacherous cold ocean. When you walk out the room, you are instantly shouted at for help from Brody. Kaz! I need your help here! Brody being one of the workers we saw earlier in the canteen. Brody tells Kaz that he could only save him and that he couldn't save the other man who fell into the deep, cold ocean. Brody informs Kaz that McGregor, the other man who fell that Brody could not save, is not the only casualty caused by this mysterious explosion from the rig. You got me out! Did you get Gregor? I got you, I. I couldn't find Gregor. Fuck. I'm sorry, Kaz. Oh, Jesus. He's not the only one we lost. Brody is trying to get Raph out of a pod that he was pulled from when diving under the rig. We can hear Raph's inside screaming and panting in what seems like complete and utter panic and pain. But yet at the same time, the sounds he's making sound almost inhuman. Oh no no! Raph's is still in there! Why aren't these working? Brody tells Kaz that he needs his help, but it's clear that at this point, after losing one of his friends that he couldn't save, falling into that cold, cold, cold ocean, and having a very traumatizing flashback, that Kaz has gone into shock. Kaz! I need you to help me! Kaz! What? However, Kaz snaps out of it, thankfully, and agrees to help Brody save Raphs. Okay, so it's time for me to talk about puzzles. Well, sort of. Puzzles in Still Wakes the Deep are always very simple, and to be honest, are hardly puzzles at all. When you're using any form of interactive equipment on the oil rig, there will be an instructions picture next to it telling you what to do and how to operate it. And yeah, it's that simple. All you have to do is follow the instructions. I must say, while these puzzles aren't very difficult whatsoever, they do feel very satisfying to complete. They also fit into the world of Still Wakes the Deep very easily. You can find instructions and safety pictures slash posters all around the oil rig or even just pictures showing you where you are on the oil rig itself and this makes the game feel very very grounded and real. There are a few more thought provoking puzzles in the game but for the most part you're just following instructions when doing a puzzle but to me that's okay because it's more about world building here than it is actually solving a puzzle. The action events slash quick time events feel satisfying and fun to pull off. Overall they just make the world feel far far more believable. I mean in real life they would have instructions like this right next to equipment, so it makes sense that they do in the game as well. Anyway, after helping Brody by literally pushing two buttons, Kaz asks what happened. Brody tells Kaz that the drill hit something, but no one really knows for sure. What happened? Don't know. The drill hit something. An air pocket or gas explosion, nobody knows. But whatever it was, it was big. You were lucky, trust me. Raphs continues to scream in what seems like agonizing pain. If no. What's wrong with Raps? I don't know, alright? Decompression shouldn't be this bad. Oh, I shouldn't have let him go down there. I said I'd look after him. Kaz offers to help Brody with Raps, but Brody says it's fine and that he'll handle it. Kaz heads off to go above deck to see what damage has been caused, and to see of course what actually happened. Heading under the rig to get to the top, you soon realise you've just entered the platforming tutorial section of the game. 
Platforming in Still Wakes the Deep is simple but satisfying. You of course have your jump, your shimmy and your sprint like most games do. Even though Kaz does seem to sprint like he's just shat his pants. Like I'm not joking, it's a really strange sprint. But it's what's added to these games basic mechanics that makes the platforming more interesting. For example, crawling along a piece of wood or shimmying across a ledge, there can often be a very, very inconvenient shutter of the oil rig which will cause Kaz to lose his balance and fall. This means you the player will have to press buttons to make sure Kaz doesn't lose his balance and fall off the rig. These quick time events add that little bit more to the game and make the game feel that little bit more interactive. Even though it does feel a bit odd that these inconvenient shudders only seem to happen when Kaz is in a difficult or compromising situation, you can't complain too much as it is a video game. Also, you may have to get past fire in your way. This will mean you'll have to turn off a valve to stop the fire. This is also the same for steam as well. And then in the very late game, Game as well as gas. Sometimes you'll have to take the leap of faith to get onto a ladder that's hanging, or on some very rare occasions you'll even have to do the monkey bars. You also may need to jump from something before it falls under you. Whatever you do, don't fall from a high place because if you do, you may get one of the weirdest and most funny death sounds ever. Fuck! I will catch you, and I will never let you go again! I'M JOKING! <laughs> Platforming in the game is very simple for the most part, but it does have some charm to it. Through it be how Kaz makes comments on situations he's in. Jesus. the having to perform quick time events themselves, the game's parkour is simple but satisfying and fun like most things in the game. Also might as well say it now, this is where the game introduces the feature to be able to open doors that are locked. There's nothing really of any interest to note here other than the fact it's really satisfying to pull off. Now let's talk about something a lot of people had a problem with that thing being yellow paint. For years now, gamers have been debating whether games have too much yellow paint or not. If you're unaware, games like Dying Light 2 and Mirror's Edge use yellow paint to indicate where the player can go and what the player can interact with. Still Wakes the Deep is no different. Now, Still Wakes the Deep uses yellow paint a lot, and I mean a lot. So it's caused a bit of a stir in the gaming community to whether or not the game is holding the player's hand too much. And yeah, to be fair, I can see why people are annoyed by this. The game is linear, so that means pretty much for the whole game you're only following one path. So that begs the question, why so much yellow paint then? Sadly, the game, as far as I'm aware, did not come out with an option to limit or turn off the yellow paint. Though thankfully, it does have one now. So the question is, what do I think about this? Well, having yellow paint marking interactables to me isn't that bad, as it tells the player exactly what they can and can't interact with in the world. But having yellow paint absolutely everywhere, feeding the player information on where they exactly need to go, makes the game feel a very handholdy and feels very unnecessary. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't take away from the game's overall charm and experience, however, just as you play the game more and more, you will notice the yellow paint more and more. I just wish there was a way to turn it off when the game first launched. Anyway, back to the game. Kaz looks up in awe at the large, tentacle-like creature wrapped around the drill before he is shouted at to go inside as it's unsafe by one of his fellow crewmates, Douglas. Once again, we see that strange substance at the side of Kaz's face when he stands near this weird tentacle-like thing. Once we make our way inside leg C of the oil rig, we can see this tentacle-like creature wrapping itself up the leg, moving quickly and spreading rapidly. Rainick's voice can be heard from over the intercom, telling workers to stand down while he finds out what's wrong with the drill, showing how just out of touch he truly is, as he knows nothing about what's going on below him. Jesus Christ. 
think this shows just how inconsiderate Rainick really is to the people working below him. He probably doesn't even know that people have died. At the bottom of the oil rig's leg, Kaz finds a flashlight, which he mounts to his helmet. Entering a flooded back room of the oil rig, you can see just how much damage has been done, with the oil rig seeming to be groaning and moaning, and the entire floor being covered in water up to waist height. And to top this bad situation off, the lights are completely out. The only way you can see is with your helmet flashlight. The music suddenly and rapidly picks up as you hear the distant scream of something in the distance. The fuck is that? It's here where the mechanic of opening vents is introduced, which you can use throughout the game to get around obstacles and even sometimes evade danger. Entering a small room, you can see the floor littered with blood. Something is clearly not right here. Entering another room, you can see Finley, who seems to be shaken up from just the look on her face alone. Finley tells Kaz that Kibble is the one making that strange screaming-like noise and that he needs to stay away from him. Finley says that Kibble turned feral when he got some oil on him or something, and that when she tried to help him, he tried to attack her. Tell me why you've seen a ghost. Who's making that noise? Gibble. He's making that racket. Should we no find him? Help him? No. I not recommend that. What does that mean? It means he's not alright. After that explosion, they got oil or some shit on him and just... I don't know. He freaked out. Wait for me. Kaz heads off as it's the only way back to accommodation. Before he goes, Finley tells him to be careful. Again. Kaz! Be careful, eh? Hey, you know. I mean, to be honest, I don't know why Kaz doesn't just crawl through the metal gated gap, which is clearly easily fittable through, but hey, they've got to make it a video game somehow. Going deeper and further into the oil rig, you can see more and more blood, and these strange oil-like splodges appear on the sides of Kaz's face again. Entering a larger room, you can find a locker that the player can now hide in. You know the horror is about to start when you can now hide in places. It's big, scary, and pink! So's Patrick's car! Lockers like this are a nice addition to the game. However, personally, I don't think you will be using them all too often, as I personally didn't, as the game has many more natural hiding spots that the player can hide. However, this is still a nice addition to the game. Going through this very tight, large room, the oil-like splodges get bigger and bigger on Kaz's vision, as you can hear the distant screams and strange noises of kibble growing closer and closer. If you're one of the few people in the world who play games with subtitles on, like seriously, what are you doing? Get fully immersed, don't use subtitles like me, just go in and hope for the best. Ah, the sweet sound of Davy Rennick. You think it's the Paulus? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Then you'd be able to understand the strange things Kibble is saying as he grows nearer and nearer. Oh, just take it easy. Now I don't think you can actually die in this section, it's more just an introduction section into how the oil splodges indicate when an enemy is growing nearer and nearer. And of course, to show off hiding places to the player. Kibble seems to be almost possessed as you can hear him screaming out how he doesn't want to hurt the player. When you reach a door with a ladder going down it, Kaz is locked inside and thrown down the ladder. You can see for just a split second the strange silhouette of some sort of creature that seemed to throw you down it. You hear whatever that thing is banging on the door trying to get in at Kaz. Gibble's frantic screaming now begins to set in, and the atmosphere picks up intensely. Oh, 
Now desperately trying to escape, you turn a corner and find one of your fellow workmates dead, sloped up against a ladder covered in oil. Then, once you escape this sinister, dark room, you once again are greeted with complete silence, with the only thing you being able to hear is the distant cries and screams of kibble. I think the truly horrifying thing about this section is here at the end, where all you can hear is kibble begging for help. In fact, the last thing you hear kibble say is him begging someone to tell his mum he'll be with her soon. Jesus. Once you reach the exit room, you're tasked with getting warm. And to be honest, there are many sections like this in the game where you're tasked with just getting warm or finding a heater. I personally think these sections were put in the game so that the player could have some downtime, and so the player could think about what's just happened, and so that Kaz can express what he's going through throughout the game. Oh God, stop. Shit. Fuck. God, stop thinking about it. Just stop thinking about it. Jesus. Entering accommodation, Kaz gets a phone call from O'Connor, telling him that there is something wrong in engineering, and that he is coming up through the leg of the oil rig. Kaz tries to warn O'Connor that he can't come up through the leg of the oil rig, as it's completely blocked by whatever that thing is, so he'll need to go through accommodation. However, before he can fully say it, he's cut off as the phone goes dead. You need to tell me twice. Listen, something's wrong in engineering. It's not safe. We'll go through the leg and come up through the under rig. Rennick, better give the evacuation. O'Connor, you have to go through accommodation. It's all blocked. Do you hear me? O'Connor! Kaz makes his way through accommodation. Kaz can hear the screams of a man called Trotz, one of his friends, from a closed door in the social room of the oil rig. Kaz tries to help as he doesn't know what's going on in there, but to the player it's blatantly obvious what's going on in there. But the door won't open one bit, so all Kaz can see is a blinding white light whilst listening to his friend scream. Trotz? Get off me! Trotz, is that you? I can't hear you, man. Open the door. Trotz, the door's blocked. I can't get to you. What's up, wee man? Are you hurt? Kaz finds Roy in a complete panic, stockpiling poo- <laughs> ha -ham. Kaz finds Roy in a panic, stockpiling food and trying to hide in a storage room. Get in, quick. Thank God you're alright. Jesus, what are you doing in here? What do you think I'm doing in here? What the bloody hell is going on? Kaz informs Roy on the situation, telling him that things are bad out there and people have died. <sighs> people are dying, Roy. Dead. <sighs> Who, who's, who's dead? How? Douglas. Trotz, I think. I, I don't know, it's, it's this thing. I, I think it's doing something to people. I don't know what to believe, you know what I mean? And Roy tells Kaz that he did in fact see some sort of weird thing out on the deck, which scared him enough to have him run in here and start stockpiling food. I do, I really do. I saw something out on the deck. I, I didn't stay to look, it just scared the shit out of me. I should barricade the door. Roy and Kaz decide that their best bet is to get to the lifeboats and get off the rig. I should barricade the door. We can't hide, Roy. We have to get off this rig right the fuck now. What, without Rennick say so? Roy, did you hear Rennick? What, you think we're getting evacuated? He'd want everybody back at work if we were at the bottom of the North fucking sea. <sighs> right. The lifeboats, then? Aye. It's here when Roy admits to Kaz that he is scared and he wouldn't blame Kaz if he left him behind. You stay, barricade the door, let me clear a path and once we're ready to go, I'll come and get you, right? I'll be here, don't worry. Getting some extra prayers in. <laughs> we're gonna need them. Kaz, um, you, you won't leave me. It's bloody terrifying out there. I'm not leaving you, pal. I wouldn't blame you if you did, mate. 
Mình. Which of course contrasts the very confident and supportive Roy we saw at the start of the game. Kaz does his best to reassure Roy that he will not leave him. You've got all the food in here for a start. <laughs> Listen, get your man upstairs on the case and I'll see you soon, right? And it's here in this two minute interaction, we can really get a feel of how good Roy and Kaz's connection is to each other. You can really see that Roy is terrified and he really needs Kaz's support and help here. In the same sense that you can see Kaz is scared, he just doesn't want Roy to know that and wants to help Roy. As you move through the rig, you can see strange purple biomass everywhere seeming to wrap itself around the rig and be taking it over by the second. You can find one part of the rig's ceiling covered in strange mass with the heads of Kaz's crewmates stuck inside it. Something even further more disturbing is these strange tentacle-like things can be seen pulsing as if they have a heartbeat. Entering the laundry room, you can hear strange noises coming from somewhere. Hello? Anybody in here? There are warnings of Gale. When you go to leave the room, Kaz is knocked over by something that looks like a tentacle coming through the ceiling. Once you make your way to the outside of the rig, you can see just how much damage has been done, as you're gonna have to parkour like your Kyle Crane just to get to the lifeboats. Rainick's voice can be heard over the intercom once again telling the crewmates to head to the nearest evacuation point, but not to be too happy because he wants them back to work in 15 minutes. Attention crew of the Vera! All personnel need to get to the nearest evacuation point. And don't you all get too excited now. You'll all be back at work in 15 minutes once I get all this nonsense straightened out. Fucking bastard. Like I said before, this just shows how out of touch Rainick is and how he truly does not know the severity of the situation going on on his own oil rig. Once you actually make it down to the lifeboats, you can find that nearly all of them have been damaged or destroyed, leaving only the one on the end as a valid option. However, we all know how this is going to go. If Kaz just got on the lifeboat and left, this game would be about 40 minutes long and not 3 hours long. So of course, while following the instructions trying to get the lifeboat ready, it malfunctions causing the boat to drop prematurely and become useless to Kaz and Roy. This just shows how both Rainick and Cadell truly did not care about the safety of the workers on board their oil rigs and just wanted to cut as many corners as they could and of course spend as little money as possible on the rig's safety features so that they could get to drilling oil as quickly as possible. One of the service phones rings next to Kaz. Picking it up, we can hear Rainick's voice on the other end. Rainick asks Kaz if he's with anyone and if he is, he needs to get to the helicopter as soon as possible. I have to give some praise to the voice acting here because it's just so good. It sounds spot on to just how two real human beings would sound who don't particularly like each other talking to each other in a stressful situation like this. But then again, all the voice acting in this game is so good, so real, and so human. I wish I could say the same for other games. I thought... You're here. We haven't got much time. Who are you? Why have you been watching us? I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. Who's that? Renick, it's me, Kaz. McClary, what the fuck are you doing to my life, boat? It's gone. It's just fell off into the fucking sea. You must have done it wrong. Fuck off, Renick. You built this fucking thing, not me. Who's with you? Uh, Roy's in the canteen. Finley and Brody are alive. Listen to me, McClary. Get your ass up to the chopper pad, bring anyone else you can find to, and whatever you do, don't touch this stuff all over the bear. Getting this phone call, you may initially think that Rainick has come to his senses and has realised what's going on on the rig and has decided to try and save as many of his workers as possible. However, you would be wrong because Rainick reveals his true intentions when Kaz asks if they're okay now. What about you? Just concentrate on getting to the pad, don't worry about me. You see, Rainick? What? Well, does this mean we're okay, like? No hard feelings? Get to fuck, McClary, and when you get back, fuck off again. I'd be happy to see you drown, but I'm not having your death on my fucking record. Go on your cell, you old fud. I also find it kind of funny that Kaz, despite all the things he's seen and experienced so far in this awful oil rig, still wants to work there and not face his responsibilities on the mainland. Oh yeah, and if you wanted any more reason to think the rig was built shit, then Rainick reveals that locked doors can just be kicked down. 
Brilliant. Turning a corner, you can see fire blocking your path. This means you'll have to find a fire extinguisher to clear the path forward. There are many moments like this in the game where there's a fire blocking your path, so you'll have to try and find a fire extinguisher to clear the fire. This type of puzzle, if you can even call it that, is not very hard, but it's very satisfying to do, and it's extremely satisfying to use a fire extinguisher in this game. I don't know why it just is, man. Dying to the fire or getting caught on fire results in the bottom of your screen literally looking like I slapped a PNG of fire at the bottom of my screen using Photoshop. While this isn't a deep system, it's a welcome addition to the game. Entering a small room, you get a phone call from a worker called Inners. However, there's nothing you can do, as something seems to attack or possibly kill him whilst he's on the phone. I, I, I don't know what to do this time. What was that? Come on, stop. Let's do this. Come on, no! Ennis. Ennis! Going back inside, there is an obstacle blocking your path, which you'll need to move before progressing. However, once you do that and entering the rig further, you can see just how much this purple, strange biomass has been infecting the rig. Making your way through the vents of the oil rig, you can hear something below you and see blood. Turning the corner, you can see some sort of bloody flesh-like creature opening and shutting a washing machine. Horrifyingly, the bubbly large creature can somewhat be made out to be human, with with its large tentacles sticking to walls around it. Jesus. Entering the room and getting closer to it, you can see with a good look that it was sadly one of your fellow crewmates at one point, Trots. You can hear him groaning in pain and even hear him speaking, showing that there is somehow someone still in there somewhere. Okay, so let's actually talk about the horror gameplay, because horror gameplay makes up most of the best gameplay from Still Wakes the Deep. Your basic mechanics are you can run and sprint, you can hide in marked locations for hiding spots, you can throw things to distract enemies, and you can peek left or right to see where enemies are. There's even a button you can click to check behind you if you're being chased by something, but you won't really need this button very often, much like the peek buttons, you won't really need to peek either. This is because if you're being chased in the game, you're normally being chased because you messed up and and therefore you're gonna die, or you're being chased because the game wants you to be chased. For the most part, you won't need this button to quickly look where enemies are behind you, you just won't need it. Horror gameplay is actually done really, really well. The player needs to be on their toes, as enemies won't always just chase you from a ground level. Other times, enemies will be towering over you, high above you outside, so you'll need to think about distracting them. And some other times, you may want to learn where an enemy is going, so you can outthink the enemy, and use your time vitally to escape. When you get caught by an enemy, the game will result in an instant game over, showing a weird substance taking over the player and killing them as the death scream. It will also play a loud audio cue to tell the player that they have died. Like I said before, the game's horror gameplay is really good. And of course, the most important thing is that it's scary. Seeing these disgusting, fleshy-like monsters chase you and come out while shouting about how they don't want to do this and they're so sorry and that they're in pain is scary. And it keeps the player on their feet and always engaged. Overall, horror gameplay is great in Still Wakes the Deep, and it feels fun, scary, and fair. After a close call with Trots, you head back to Roy to tell him about your discovery of Trots, and then to also inform him about the lifeboats, or rather the lack of any working lifeboats. Hey, Kaz, you alright? Jesus, you look terrible. Do not go down those fucking stairs. What the hell is going on? Uh, trots. I think it was Trots. And then it's just fucking horrible, whatever it is. Just stay in here and keep quiet. Did you get to the lifeboats? Yeah. Fuck knows if they ever work, but they definitely don't fucking work now. Kaz informs Roy that he spoke to Rainick and that Rainick told them that they need to get to the chopper. Get to the chopper! He still reckons we should get to the bird. You think? He got a better idea. But Roy has a major problem. That problem being, he's diabetic, meaning he needs his insulin. Kaz, mate, I'm not gonna make it over the deck. I'm not feeling so good, pal. I think I need my insulin. What? Fucking kidding, Roy, no. Oh, I'm sorry to inconvenience you, Mr. Bloody Fit and Healthy. I tell you what, I'll have a little chat with my pancreas, shall I, and tell it to pull its socks off. Right, all right, fuck's sake. Could you not just eat some fucking jam or something? Oh, bloody hell, the man's a medical genius. I'll get on the blower to Dr. fucking Spock and tell him not to panic. We've solved diabetes here. It's fucking McCoy. No Spock. He was the point here. <laughs> <laughs> 
After Kaz is done solving diabetes, Roy agrees that he will head back to his cabin to get his insulin while Kaz goes to the helicopter to make sure that Roy is waited for. <laughs> you think you can manage to get to your cabin? You've summoned there, right? I'll get to the helipad. Make sure that doesn't he try to leave him without you. All right. I'm not useless. I can get there. Kaz leaves, telling Roy to be safe, and the two men go on their ways. Tell Archie to radio in the support ship. We, 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 we need all the fucking help we can get, Kaz. All right, big man, all right. Just be careful, okay? My girls need their godfather in one piece. Once again, this scene with Roy is amazing. The two voice actors absolutely smash it out of the park here, and you can truly tell that Roy and Kaz have such a good connection, and that Kaz is doing everything he can to support Roy, and Roy is trying his hardest to make things easy for Kaz, even though he struggles. Once again, what an amazing scene. Heading outside, once again, you can see just how much damage has been done to the rig in such a short amount of time. You can hear the screams of some sort of monster coming from somewhere outside. <laughs> Whatever it is. Once again, Rainick's voice can be heard from over the intercom, telling workers it's their responsibility to get to the helicopter and not his, giving himself an excuse to take off without them if he feels like it. All personnel, this is an evacuation order. Thinks he can fucking leave us. Making your way further through the outside of the rig, you can see a long tentacle pull one of your fellow crewmates away into the thick fog, and all you can do is watch. No, no, no! Christ almighty! You run into Inners, a worker you were on the phone to earlier who you thought died. However, is still alive and talking to you now. Side note, but what the fuck sort of name is Inners? I'm sorry, how, I keep nearly saying it wrong. Who? Why are you called in? You find Inners in a complete state of shock and confusion, as he even tried to reason with Murloc, the monster rampaging round the deck, killing anyone in his sight. Kaz tells Inners that clearly Murloc is not himself anymore, and the two of them just need to focus on getting to the helicopter. I don't understand, Kaz. Listen, we have to get to the helipad, all right? I'm trying to get to him, but he came for me. Like, he didn't care me at all. It's no him anymore, Inners. Is that me? Do but leave. Save who we can. Aye, uh, aye, uh, you're right. But the only way up is the crew lift. He won't let anyone leave. Then we need to get past him. Uh, all right. I'll see you there. But hey, then he be a hero if he hears me, all right? Then don't let him hear you. Uh, see you at the lift. And then the gameplay begins. This is your first open area with a monster, and this is my favourite sort of encounter, as you will really need to look where Murloc is and then move from cover to cover to avoid him at all costs. Overall, it's a really fun section because if you're not switched on all the time, there are some moments where you can get caught quite easily. Once you find Inners again, you can see him trapped inside a container, so you will have to use the hoist controls to move a box blocking his way, and yours. Christ. Can you get out? Let's not no. do that again. You almost coming at me. I just froze. I didn't get how I got myself in here, but the cargo hoist came down and we're right crabs in that tree up now. Are, are those the hoist controls behind the fence? Maybe I can shift it. All right. You're a good lad, Kaz. Once you do this, you'll have to make a mad dash to the lift. However, as the lift starts to go up, Inners is grabbed by one of Murr's tentacles. Kaz tries to hold on to him as best as he can, but it proves futile. This section is great. One horrifying thing about the section is listening to Murr still being trapped inside this disgusting abomination, he has some form of consciousness, and at least it seems like he can tell what's going on around him. Also, the gameplay in this segment is also really fun. You may need to distract the monster, you may need to hide from the monster, and you will certainly need to run from the monster in one section. 
Overall, it's a really great second introduction to the horror segment of Still Wakes the Deep. It gives you a real good taste of the overall gameplay around horror. Once you're at the top of the lift, you can hear Rainick and Archie arguing. Rainick arguing that they need to leave now, whereas Archie telling Rainick that they need to give the others more time to get there. We should go back and get them! Like hell we should! You shot them! They're gone! Get a move on! Archie! Rainick! We have to give them more time! You told them to come! What I told them is that we are leaving! And we are leaving! Now! Sadly, Rainick gets his own way, and by the time you get to the chopper, it's already halfway taking off. And there's no way that Rainick and Archie didn't see Kaz here, as he's blatantly waving for help. But just when all hope seems lost, the helicopter appears to be coming back. Perhaps they saw you and want to save you but it's coming back a lot quicker than it should be for a safe landing. The helicopter crashes, knocking Kaz out. I can see some people calling it a bit convenient or inconvenient that the helicopter just happened to crash, but if you were listening to the radios throughout the game, then they actually tell you that it's extremely stormy, so it's not that far-fetched to believe that Rainick, being a dumbass, thought it'd be fine to just go in a storm, and then the helicopter crashed. Christ. We enter a second flashback where we see Kaz talking to his wife Sue about leaving for the rig. Well, I say talking, they're more arguing than anything else. Sue is trying to tell Kaz that his problems with the police won't just go away if he leaves mainland Scotland. You can't better than to let you two together. The two greatest minds of your generation united over a bucky. Nobel Prize Committee will be warming up their checkbooks already. You seriously, seriously think if you leave the country, this will just blow over? Sue tells Kaz that he doesn't even know anything about oil rigs or how their electric works. He only knows how to fix terrorist houses electric. No one's going to chase me out into the middle of the North Sea. My mum always said I'd marry beneath me, Kaz, but I thought you were smarter than this. I'm fucking doing my best. No, no, you're not doing your best. What do you know about oil rigs, you roaster? Good with a lecky. Oh, terrace houses, Kaz. Flat, maybe a shop. They're just feeling adventurous. Kaz desperately pleads with Sue, telling her that Roy will be there and that everything will be okay. But Sue hits Kaz with a reality check that Roy is nothing more than a cook. Oh, for, for God's sake. Roy's a cook. He's a chef. He's a cook. It's just for a few weeks. We'll just let it cool down a bit. Then I'll call Billy Chamberlain and have a word. This uh, makes me think that the people getting the jobs for the oil rig weren't exactly the most qualified workers in the world to begin with. This was probably so that Cadal slash Rainick could pay the workers on the rig less, as they would have a more valid excuse because these workers weren't as experienced as proper experienced workers would be. Therefore, they may be able to get away with paying them a lot less than they should be getting paid for the jobs they're doing. The flashback ends with Sue telling Kaz that if he leaves, she is done with him. And When are you leaving? Tomorrow, Mama. You are shitting me, McCreary. It's the girls' school concert. I'm fucking scum, up, Sus. What do you want from me? I'm just saying this, Kaz. If you leave us, if you run, if you go, then we are done. Hear me. As for what leaves really means, we don't know. As we know, Sue is still with Kaz, or at least wants to be with Kaz when she writes the letter to him at Christmas. Mind you, I'm pretty sure she threatens to leave him in that letter as well, so who knows? I won't wait forever. The flashback ends and we see Kaz slowly standing up, still talking to who he thinks is Sue. After he realises it was all in the head, he then acknowledges his hallucination, which is a detail I really like. In so many games you have the main character hallucinating, but then they never acknowledge the fact that they've just hallucinated something awful or strange, they just sort of deal with it and it's really bizarre. Light work, no reaction. It's also worth noting that Kaz was going to say... Oh, don't say that. I'm... I'm here. Sus. Fucking hell. Showing that he really still wanted to be with Sue, even when he was leaving, and wants to be right now. Entering Rainick's office, the phone rings, picking it up, and you hear the voice of Brody on the other end. As at this point seems completely out of hope, but luckily, Brody is not. Hello? Hi, it's Brody. Jesus, the fucking chopper, man. Aye, I saw it. Did you get to the lifeboat? Aye, the busted fucking kid down. 
mechanisms are completely fucked, cheap bastards. Brady tells Kaz to get to the radio room and phone for a support ship so that they can have some help off this rig. I need you to do this. I need you to get to the radio room and call the support ship. It's fucked, man. The fucking crane fell on it. As the two men are talking, the lights and electric goes out, showing that the rig's condition is only going to get further worse. Brady tells Kaz he needs to get down to the generators and stop them from short-circuiting so that they can have power. You may be thinking, why can't Brody just do it himself? Well, he says he can't, and that's about the only reason you're given. I'm not going down there again, fucking gibble. Kaz, if the lecky cuts out, you won't have a choice. You go and do it. Not Kaz, I'm busy. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Well, I can see how some people would complain about this, saying that it feels like you're the only person actually trying to do anything to help the situation, but I wouldn't say that's exactly true. As you hear throughout the game, people normally have a pretty good excuse to why they're not doing the thing you're doing. Most of the time, people are already occupied keeping the rig safe in one other area, doing something else to help Kaz, or overall have something more important that needs to be done, or something that Kaz can't do himself. I'll say one really cool detail about entering Rainick's office for the second time is you can now read the letter that Rainick got from Mainland, and yeah, it's not very good. It's basically just saying that McCleary assaulted someone. <laughs> That's assault. That's, That's assault. assault. No, it's yeah. Not. After this, you can get a phone call from Darius, who is at the lifeboats, but there's nothing interesting or noteworthy to talk about here, so let's just move on. During the next room, you can get a phone call from a petrified Scooby, who's getting chased by something in the walls, or stalked by something. However, once again, nothing too noteworthy, so we'll move on. <laughs> Fuck! Yes. Very sad. Anyway, it got moving further through the rig's hallways, something seems very off. As the rig's insides look like they've been torn through by something. Turning a corner, you can find what was or what is left of Rainick. Just one large inflated head with tentacles coming from all sides of it. The scene is truly something horrifying for Kaz. Jesus fucking Christ! I Yes, the first thing I thought was skibbity toilet as well when I looked at it. Fucking TikTok brain rot humor. This section there is no hiding. You have to run and run fast. This section is amazing and it's very, very, very intense. In one point you're stuck in this room where there's a crate blocking your path and you have to push it before rain it gets through this wall that he's trying to break through to get to you. There are moments where the floor collapses under you. There are moments where you have to turn around and run from rain it because he's running towards you. This section is incredibly intense and what tops it off is hearing Rainick's disgusting and disturbing voice screaming at the player for help whilst running after them. <laughs> Dialogue from infected Rainick is terrifying and works amazingly to create an intense atmosphere. <laughs> Going back outside, you see what's left of Rainick's helicopter hanging from the rig. So logically, you use it as a piece of parkour. And then you get a phone call from a bloke called Bruce, but uh, he dies, so there's nothing really here that needs to be said. Bruce! Bruce, can you hear me? <laughs> Moving into engineering, you find Finlay, where Kaz and Finlay discuss how lovely Rainick is and was. Then they decide to work together to fix the generators. Finlay. Jesus, am I glad to see you. Aye, you and all. Fucking Rennick nearly had me. He's, 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 he's changed. He's fucking vicious. He's like changed much to me. <laughs> Have you seen anybody else? Uh, uh, Brody. He sent me down here to restart the Jennies. The generators, aye. That's where I was headed. You turn the generators on, however, they do not stay on for very long. Once Kaz informs Finley, he decides he'll restart the generators manually while Finley sorts out the fault. Really, he'll just keep resetting until we fix it. We'll need to restart the generator manually. Right, where you go then? There's two jobs here, McCleary. The Jenny's in the fault. You deal with the Jennies, and I'll find the fault. While trying to get to the generator controls, you run into Adler, who could be doing better. Fuck. Oh, dear. 
This stealth section is one of my favorite in the game. It's quiet, long, open, but it also is small enough so that you can't just sprint to one hiding place and then to the next. Instead, what you will want to do is use distractions to ensure that you can make it to the generator controls. Once you reach the generator controls, you will need to find the combination to reactivate them. This puzzle is quite simple, you just need to get the combination right, and once you do that, you're away. Finley shows up again, and it's now that you know you have to restart the generators manually. We are in business. We've gone for full power to batteries. He's sitting in the fucking dark. What are you all about? Oh, you're getting in a stushy is going to help us, is it? Just get that generator running. It's out in the floor. The key for it should be in there somewhere. I'll be out here looking for the fault. We'll be looking out for a dare as well, all right? Once you find the key and put it in to restart the generators, Finley appears again and tells you she's located and found the fault. I can see where the fault is. It's blown a fuse back in mud handling. Mud handling? Does that know where the deer is? Yes, it's coming back. You need to move. Get back to mud handling and fix that fuse. Setting off to find and fix the fuse box, you will have to make sure to avoid Adler and then do the same when coming back from the fuse box. You will then need to restart the relay and once you do this, the power comes back on and you get a phone call from Brody. Brody comes with some not great news as he reveals the oil rig has begun to sink and that Kaz will need to go down to the pontoons to fix the issue. I thought it was Finley with the lights coming back on. It worked? Oh, thank Christ. Finley was here but we, we get separated. You all right? Aye, the rig is me though. We're starting to sink. Are you kidding me? How long till it goes under? Soon, if we do nothing. Look, I need you to come down to the pontoon. Kaz at this point in the game is completely battered and out of hope, but thankfully Brody isn't and tells him he's made it this far, so he needs to keep going. The if we engage the tension when she's in all four legs, we can buy some time. <laughs> What's the point? The pontoons, the electricity, they... they Fucking things, it's a fucking nightmare. What are you on about? You survived this long, haven't you? More than can be said for most of the poor bastards on this rig. Christ, Kaz, somebody up there must like you. Aye, that's what Roy keeps telling me. Aye. Well, he's a Barnsley fan, so he'll be used to praying. <laughs> Aye, you're no wrong there. Kaz decides to try his best. Either. You're the jammiest bastard on this rig, and we need that right now. So let's do this. Aye. What do I need to do? You engage the winches in legs A and B, and I'll do the others. Easy. There's a direct route down from engineering. Hi, all right. I'll, uh, I'll find my way down. Top man, Kat. I'll give you a shout over the tannoy if we're in business. What a absolutely great section of the game. It's the longest straight horror gameplay part of the game, but it's also the best. It's not only fun, but it's also just right when it comes to horror and difficulty. I particularly love that this section of the gameplay in horror is focused on using distractions and really trying to outthink the monster. Entering one of the legs, you will have to parkour your way down to the pontoon section. This, as far as I'm aware, is the longest parkour section in the game, I think anyway. And it's also really really fun and really well done. You have to pretty much just put everything you've already learned about parkour to make your way down to the bottom. Once you reach the bottom, you'll have to engage your first winch. And it's at this section in the game where swimming is introduced as a gameplay mechanic. In fact, this whole section of the game is basically just the equivalent to an underwater Mario level. Swimming mechanics are simple but work effectively for the game. You can swim on both the surface and of course under the water. I know, what revolutionary mechanics. Oh my god! Wow! Don't get me wrong though, swimming does open the door to a lot more different encounters in the game. The new mechanic with swimming that I can think of, which is a bit different to other games, is the fact that you can grab onto things and boost yourself forward whilst you're under the water, which is pretty cool. This mechanic can be a bit flimsy sometimes when Kaz just refuses to grab onto the thing in front of him, but overall for the most part it works fine. Going through this underwater section, you can see just how many workers were drowned in what I assume was the initial explosion of the rig. It's clear to say at the least that you won't be finding any other survivors down here with you. When entering another large flooded room, the intercom turns on. On the other side, the voice that can be heard is none other than Suze, Kaz's wife.
It's clear that something is fucking with Kaz's head here, whether it's the stress of everything happening around him or the actual parasite itself. Infecting his mind, it's unclear, but something is clearly getting to him. To make things even worse, parts of the rig now begin to flood, and I mean flood, which means visibility will be even worse than it was before. It's very obvious why so many of your fellow workmates died down here. With little visibility, freezing cold water, and hard to find navigation, it's clear that almost all of them were doomed from the start. The music in this section is nothing but foreboding, and does a great job at making you feel completely isolated and alone. Going through a Mario pipe, you make it to the next room, which begins to flood immediately, so you will have to try and find your own path away from the water. Entering another room, you can hear the distant voice of a man called O'Connor, who we saw before, the same man who called Kaz, who we believed was dead. No! O'Connor? Is that you? O'Connor is in agonizing pain and attached to tentacles of one of the monster's flesh-like bits. He can be heard desperately calling for someone called Mary, maybe his wife. Kaz realizes there's nothing he can do for him and goes to leave. However, a tentacle launches from out of O'Connor's and tries to grab Kaz. Luckily, Kaz manages to break free with the help of the player button mashing. We then release Wench B and Brody comes over the intercom saying he's done his part as well and both of you can meet up on the surface of the oil ring. Heading up the lift, you're greeted with the beautiful but yet disturbing sight of the monster's tentacles wrapping itself around the inside legs of the rig, all while beautiful music is playing in the background of the scene. It's a great way to just have the player have a moment of reflection on everything they've seen and witnessed so far in the game, and also just a great send-off of the leg part of the game, as you never really head back down to this area of the rig again. Heading back into accommodation, you are tasked with getting warm, which makes sense considering how cold the water would have been that you were just swimming in. Remember, you're in the North Sea. In this room, you can also find a poem which is about life at sea, and also has the words, Still Wakes the Deep, in it. He said it! He said it! Heading over to the phone, you are now connected with Roy, who you haven't spoken to in a little while now. Roy is obviously in a complete worry, as he hasn't actually spoken to Kaz since Kaz told Roy that he was going to Rainix Chopper. Roy. Fuck's sake. Oh, God, wait the Lord. I've been worried sick. Sorry, pal. I've been on other shops since I last seen you. Oh, what's going on, Kaz? What happened with the chopper? I tried to go with this, but... Well, didn't they work out well for him or the bird? Aye, I saw Finlay. We had to get the Jennies on, and Brody as well, helping with the tension legs. The two men have a short heart-to-heart -heart talk, and Kaz jokes about the fact that he now knows everything about an oil rig, considering how much he's had to do and fix in his time on the rig in just this one day. Do you know what? I'm a fucking rig expert now. <laughs> Told you to take no time. Yeah, I'm glad you've not been alone out there. Kaz then also goes on to talk to Roy about his experience with O'Connor's. I saw O'Connor. He's one of these things, but I thought, oh, fuck, I don't know what I thought, but whatever it is, folk are being turned into, there's something of them still in there. Worryingly, we discover that Roy has still not yet had his insulin shot, so Kaz offers to go get it for Roy, but Roy says no, it's fine, he'll do it. What's going on, Roy? Do you need me to come and get you? Oh, no, I can do it. Uh, you saw this rig out. Find a way to get us home. See you, girls. The heartfelt conversation comes to an abrupt end as Kaz sees an explosion in the distance and goes to check it out, so the two men head their separate ways once more. See you, girls. All right? Hi. You're a good lad, Kaz. That's why Suze loves you. She does, you know. 
Sorry, I have to go, Roy. Will you make it to the cabins, all right? Yeah, I'm on the way now. You, uh, be on yours. I'm praying for you, mate. Remember, Jesus loves you, Cos. Everyone else thinks you're a c**t. Ha! <laughs> all right, pal. Efters. Once again, this is just such an amazing interaction between the two characters and really shows their connection on a deeper level. Roy clearly being scared shitless, but still acting like this older brother slash uncle to Kaz, and Kaz doing everything he can to make light of this very dark and morbid situation they're in. The two men's connection feels realistic and deep, and it works extremely well for the story. Before you leave, the phone rings again, and if you choose to pick it up, you will hear the voice of Sue talking to who I think is Kaz. Ah, here he is. Listen, I, I don't have long. I left away my mum. I had to get out. She's hurting me. I'm, I'm going off my head. Sus! Is that you? Uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> this one's trying to give me a kick in the all. Going to be a wee boxer, eh? Ah, uh, you wish. I wish I could see you. You're beautiful like this. Aye? Well... I feel like an elephant. Christ, what is this? This is what I can assume is a flashback within a phone. And there's nothing really here I can add other than all I can say is that we can clearly see how bad Kaz's mental state has got. His hallucinations have become far more frequent now. Heading outside, you can see that this parasite is nearly completely taken over the oil rig, with oil dripping and leaking from absolutely everywhere. While walking across the rig, once again, Kaz can hear the distant voice of Suze. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is happening to me? And it's clear that it's maybe the parasite that's starting to cause these effects to happen to Kaz, these hallucinations to occur. Heading up a ladder, you can see Brody calling to you from inside of some sort of crane. Brody and Kaz have a brief conversation about who's still alive on the rig and the status of the rig itself before talking about what needs to be done now. Fucking hell, how you doing? Better than you, but the looks of it. Did you see any others? You mean anyone alive? Well, I spoke to Roy. He's no doing great without his insulin. And I've no idea where Finlay is now. I spoke to her a few minutes ago. She's stuck until she gets past Rennick. Or what used to be Rennick. Feels like everybody's deed or worse. I don't know about your side of the pontoons, but where I was, the oil tanks are burst. And I think there's a gas leak. I mean, <laughs> I'm looking for a fucking bright side here. Well... Let's cross that bridge when we come to it, all right? And what needs to be done now is fix the stack so that the whole rig does not explode. Right now, we have to deal with the stack. That noise! Aye, okay. All right, the stack. Kaz will have to go over to the processing cord where the monster version of Adair is, which of course Kaz objects to. It's burning out. It could get worse. And if it does, it could spread to the derrick and cause an explosion. Right, so we're fucked. Again. Not if we switch the flare onto the auxiliary gas pipe. If you go over to the processing quad, I what? can... What? Have you seen it out there? Oh, aye, it's quite nice in here, you know, maybe we should swap. But this objection is shot down, as Brody is the only one who knows how to operate the crane. Therefore, Kaz will have to go. You can't walk the controls, Kaz. Otherwise, I, of course, I'd go myself. Christ. All right, all right, what am I doing? You need to get there and find the diverter valve, main to the auxiliary. It's on the middle floor, flare side. I'll ignite the stack from here. Right. If I can't do it, then you'll need this. Jesus, I'll be on the tannoy if you need any help. Now I must say, this final horror section with Adair is extremely linear. So I can say from playing this game three times that it is extremely hard to fail this section as you're basically on rails the whole time. But nonetheless, it's still a fun section to show the deterioration of the rig and to once again show how much of an asshole that Adair is. It's only game. 
Why do you have to be mad? So overall, you can't hate it too much because there have been big open sections in the game for you to do stealth gameplay around. This is just more of a linear on rail section, which is perfectly fine. Making it to the processing cord, Brody radios over to you. But of course, as usual, there's some very bad news, as the valve that you try using clearly doesn't seem to be working. Which means that Kaz will have to do it manually by firing a flare by climbing up to the end of the stack. I'm sorry Kaz, I need you to do it manually. It's too dangerous to leave it. Once you tell Brody you're ready, you head off. Use the relighter again. Fuck. Did you hear me Kaz? Wave or something so I know you're receiving. Prick. Understood. Getting to the entrance of the stack, an alarm is triggered, causing a dare to chase you up the stack. Now while you could argue the last section was a bit too on the rails, this section is on the rails but in the perfect way. This is the second chase segment in the game, but it's really fun because this time you have to actively be doing parkour to make sure you don't fall off the stack and die. I really like this chase, I like it more than the first one with Rainick as well, I just feel like the stakes feel really high. Making it to the top, Kaz throws in the flare, and let's just say we're extremely lucky that Kaz can throw like Shaquille O'Neal can dunk, because if he couldn't, then this game would have been a lot shorter. This is also where I believe you kill your first monster, as Adair catches on fire and then falls off the stack into the deep, dark ocean below. I mean, it's never confirmed if you actually kill him, but I'd assume this is a kill. Also, gotta love that when you first meet Adair, he's a complete and utter asshole, and even when he turns into a monster on his deathbed, he is a complete and utter asshole. Well, you are not be missed. You are then tasked with running as quickly as you can to get off the stack before it collapses. But while trying to run off the stack, the stack collapses, knocking Kaz unconscious for now the third time. He's nearly got knocked unconscious as many times as the Master Chief did in Halo 4. You cut to another hallucination slash flashback of Kaz arguing with Sue over what I can assume is Kaz beating up Billy Chamberlain. Kaz says that Billy Chamberlain was always jealous of him and jealous of Sue since high school, which confirms that Kaz and Sue went to the same high school, which means they've known each other for a long time. I'm not being difficult. I'm just trying to pick up the pieces of your mess. Hey, wouldn't he let it go? Okay, he's carried a fucking torch for you since school. He's always hated me for being the bigger man and for having you and those beautiful fucking wings. But Sue's not buying any of this excuse. She tells Kaz that he's not the bigger man. Oh, no. Bigger man. You are shitting me, McLean. You're the bigger man. She tells Kaz that everything they've worked for is in Kaz's name, which shows how childish he is to put this all on the line. Do you think your daughter's got more brains and bigger bar than you have? What about the kids? The flat's in your name, you've got a bar and they just take it away. Listen, Suze, come on! No, no, you just shut it, McLean! For the 800th time, Suze says he needs to sort this out or she will leave him. Come on, Suze, mate, it's getting a bit old now. Kaz, in a state of almost sadness, tells Suze that he's sorry, and Suze responds telling him to just sort it out. Suze, look, I'm really sorry. Kaz, just enough. Okay, just, just get out of my sight. Try not to put anyone else in hospital the day, yeah? This is an incredibly powerful moment and flashback, showing just how much Kaz put on the line because he felt like beating someone up. But at the same time, you can't really hate the guy as this man was insulting his wife. This is an incredibly powerful scene and it shows just how close Kaz and Sue's relationship really is and how adult it is. Waking up, we see Kaz for the second time now halfway through apologizing to what he believes is still Sue. Why do you have to... Ah, Sue's... Christ. Oh, fuck! Jesus! Am I done? This, to me, really gives me the impression that Kaz is filled with a lot of regret for when it comes to his wife and wishes he said more to her in these precious moments. Once again, for the second time now, we join Kaz on the under section of the rig, seeing the full extent of the damage the parasite has caused to the bottom of the rig itself with the main tentacle now glowing bright purple, nearly engulfing the entire bottom of the rig. Heading further through the rig, Kaz follows notes left behind by Finley and Brody, talking to each other saying where they should meet. In one of the notes, you can even see that Brody thought that Kaz died from the fall he just witnessed Kaz take, but nonetheless, he decides that the two of them need to keep pushing forward, showing how determined Brody is to get off this rig. You find Finley in engineering, and she explains Brody's plan to cut the rig loose so that it can float for long while they wait for a rescue ship. Can anything help? Aye, we can cut ourselves loose and quick like. Buy us time, maybe enough. 
Do we even know if anyone's coming? We've been off radio for hours, so I, I should hope so. Friendly. Brody joins the two of you and starts to explain his plan, however it's cut short by the sound of Roy's voice from over the intercom. Miracle! Are we doing this or no? Aye. We float the rig. I'll dive down, release the tension cables. Hopefully we balance out, maybe end up higher in the water. I'll need you both in green control. It's Roy. Roy is pleading for help as he couldn't make it to his insulin in time. He's up on the roof. I have to get him. No. Is anybody out there? You have to get to marine control with Finn. Please. It's a two-man job and we don't have much time. You think Roy does? So Kaz decides to try and save him, while Finley waits for him and Brody releases the tension cables at the bottom of the rig. Go. But this place is filling up with gas and oil from the drill to the derrick. God knows where else it's leaking to. I can't recommend it. I know, Brody. But I'm going. I have to. Engineering's your only path up there, and it's flooded, so you'll have to swim. It's a long way. Plan each step. And if you're underwater, stay calm. All oh, right, that's exactly how that'll go. Enough! You both know what you're doing, so let's go. Right here, Brody. Hold your nerve, all right, McLeary? I'm coming, Roy. At this point, nearly the whole of the rig is flooded, so you will have to swim to accommodation. Once you do conquer all that cold water and make it into accommodation, you soon realise that you're sadly not alone, because the parasitic version of Trots is in there with you. Inside of accommodation is barely even recognisable anymore, with bits of biomass and flesh hanging from almost everywhere. There's even just large gaping holes in the side of the rig anyway. And also, all the windows look like optical illusions. I'm unaware if this is because the parasite is having a mental effect effect on Kaz or not, but yeah, all the windows look like optical illusions. Taking it into one of your crewmates' rooms, you can see the remains of a ripped apart crewmate. Which makes me think how the fuck this game managed to stay a Peggy 16 in the UK. I mean, the violence is on par with an 18, and the language is so bad that I'm going to have to go through and bleep so much of it out just to make sure this video doesn't get demonetized. I don't know whose balls they had to tingle, but hey, who cares? Entering another vent, and Trots follows you in, which means you're gonna have to jiggle your little ass fast if you want to escape him. After you escape Trots, you make it to Roy's room. In Roy's room, you can find some cool stuff like photos of Roy and different things that he clearly likes. You can also get an achievement for finding his spoon that he had at the start of the game. I really love stuff like this and Still Wakes the Deep has some really fun achievements and Easter eggs. Coming out of Roy's room, you're greeted with Trots, who once more tries to make one final last ditched attempt to kill you, however is crushed by falling debris and Kaz claims his second monster victim. Now onto the roof of accommodation, you enter a room and find Roy slumped over with his hand reaching for the phone motionless on the floor. First it really does seem that Roy is just sleeping, but on second glance you can see that Roy has succumbed to his lack of insulin. Roy, talk to me big man. Come on, come on, Roy. Roy, wake up you prick. Please wake up, wake up, come on moment of pure sadness and realisation, Kaz talks to Roy, telling him not to leave him here. Don't leave me here. Please, back my come on, back Christ, don't leave me. It's here, for the first time in the game, where Kaz admits that he is just plain out scared. In a joking way, or a sarcastic manner, or with a hundred thousand cuss words, he just plain out admits to Roy that he is terrified. Christ, don't leave me. Roy, don't leave me. I can't do this, man. I'm scared, Roy. I'm fucking terrified. Kaz then goes into a complete breakdown, talking about how he will have to tell Suze and his little girls. What am I going to tell Suze? <laughs> I mean, she's going to fucking kill me, man. Right? You, big man. She really loved you. So did my girls. Wait, what were we gonna tell her? Eh? <laughs> oh, sorry. Her uncle Roy's not coming home. Aye, I know. 
Oh. Me and Ollie. I love this big man, do you hear me? I love them. One absolutely incredibly emotional and moving scene. See Roy in person a total of three times before this scene, and you hear him on the phone twice, yet this scene is just so touching and feels so human. Music in this scene is purely moving and the voice acting is incredible. Just want to say a massive thank you to Sean Dooley, the voice actor for Roy, because he does an incredible job from the start to the end. What a scene. You get a phone call from Finley who needs your help and assumes that Roy is with you. However, Kaz tells her that Roy is dead. Look, Kaz, the water's up to your admin, so how can you get to marine control? You need to try and get there from where you are, all right? Jesus. Aye. And that English bastard better come and off. You can't stay in that hut forever, no? Kaz? Kaz, are you still there? When you're no shouting, I start to worry, like. Roy make a fuss? Put him on. I'll get him tail. Kaz. For fuck's sake, what's going on? Roy's no coming. Oh, Jesus. feels completely guilty for Roy's death and says he let him down, but Finley tries to reassure Kaz, saying that he didn't. Sorry, Kaz. No. We all loved the big man, eh? I let him do. He was relying on me. No, no. No, you did everything you could. You went by for him. None of this is your fault. It's not anyone's. Look, I'm sorry, Kaz, but... We need your help here. Kaz agrees to help Finley, and they head off. Across the very top of the rig now, you can see that the monster has what's like a purple glow coming from it, and with a tornado-like debris field forming around it. Making it into marine control, you can see a semi-conscious roper nailed to his chair by biomass engulfing him. Kaz calls Finley, and for this puzzle, you will have to first phone Finley to find out exactly what you need to do. If at any point you forget what she said, you'll have to re-phone her and ask her again. I won't lie, I kind of wish you could fail here. I think it'd be really funny if you could fuck up and just blow up the rig. While following Finley's instructions, at one point you will have to get a key, which is still in Roper's hand. It's alright, pal. Here we go. I'll look after this now, alright? <laughs> Roper says the name Rainick and tells you to keep Rainick away from him, probably the person who made Roper how he is now. Kaz tries to tell Finley this, but she's not having it, and tells him to just push on and ignore it. Before flooding the pontoons and the lower decks, Kaz confirms with Finley if they need to do this and if they should do this, as that's where Brody was heading before. But Finley reassures Kaz, saying that Brody would be long gone out of the pontoons. Switch is at my right. What's next? Now you flood the forward pontoon and I mean flood it to the fucking brim. Now hold on a minute. The pontoons are already fucked full of oil and gas. This might push it all up to the deck. We don't have a choice. The whole rig could tip over. Flooding that pontoon will at least give us a fighting chance. What about Brody? Is he not down there? He'll be out of there by now. He's done his part. We just have to do it all. Right? All right. It's coming for me. Away. What was that? It's Roper. Never mind him. Flood the forward pontoon! I, I, hang on. So you nervously hit the flood button, and then you're tasked with meeting back up with Finley further in the rig. And after doing this and finding out it actually worked, the rig is beginning to float, Kaz and Finley both start to have a bit more of a morale boost. Come on, come on, what? It's moving. Did it work? Fucking aye! See, not so hopeless after all, eh? Oh, thank Christ, Finley. What now? Brody's got a plan. Meet us in drill ops as soon as you can. Okay, I'll meet you there. We're going to be all right, Kaz. I fucking hope so. Heading out, Kaz hears more of Sue's voice from the intercom. You don't work for fuck's sake. What is wrong with you? Fuck! Am I losing my mind? 
and it's at this point you can really notice that the rig is nearly completely underwater. So you will have to swim in and out of air pockets to even make your way through the rig. And the deeper and deeper you get into the rig, the more hallucinations Kaz seems to have. Oh yeah, and once again you get another phone call, and this time of course it's from Suze. I would go into great detail on how this shows that Kaz's brain is mentally getting chipped away and he's closer and closer to the edge of insanity, but I'm not going to do that, because he shouts something that sounds too close to Sui for me to give him any sympathy at this point in time. Suze! Suze! On your way back through accommodation for the second time now, Monster Rainick decides to appear and chases you through water. You manage to escape Rainick, leaving him in the cold ocean waters behind you, adding a third victim Triple to Kaz's kill. kill count, I think at least. One sad slash disturbing thing to add here is that Rainick's last words are him begging you for help, almost like his voice returns to its original human version for just a second before he succumbs to the ocean. You make it into the drill operations center where you can find Finley slouched over on the phone. She hands the phone to Kaz and walks off, sitting in the corner of the room on the floor. Kaz, you made it! Brody, what's wrong with Finley? She's freaked out here. Taking the phone, you can hear the docile voice of Brody on the other end. Brody reveals to Kaz that he's still trapped in the pontoons. In here. When it fills, it will be headed right up the drill pipe. What are you on about? I'm still in the pontoons. Oh, I've only got a couple of minutes. I can't stop it. The rig's a time bomb now. You understand? One spark and... You need to find a way off. Which he will now have no way of getting out of because you and Finley just flooded the whole area. Kaz pleads with Brody to come back up to him and even offers to go down and try and save him, but he knows that he'd only get halfway before he himself is killed. Just get back up here and we'll work it out, yeah? I can't do that. What? I can't get back up. Wait, no, way. I'm sorry. Wait, listen. You're on your own now. I'll come to you. All right? No, you won't. You wouldn't even get halfway to me. The legs flooded and the gas. It, it's not possible. You got your dive gear? Aye. Yeah, so you can use that? It's oil, Kaz. There's nothing to be done. In a very bleak and desperate moment, Brody reassures Kaz, telling him that it's alright. Brody tries to make light of this very dark situation, telling Kaz that he needs to get off this rig. Brody tells Kaz to watch Finley as he doesn't know what she's going to do after this. I'm already back on Sky. <laughs> You've never seen water like that, Kaz. Clear. Peaceful. <laughs> Just let go and everything's fine. Hi. That sounds beautiful. You go one day. <laughs> Alright? No, fuck that. I'm never swimming again <laughs> after this. <laughs> Kaz, you and Finley, you could do this, alright? I'm sure she wouldn't do something so stupid. Really? You there? Kaz? What's stupid? Talk to me. It's getting higher. Alright, I'm here, Brody. I'm not going anywhere. Alright, I'm here. Brody's last words to Kaz are get home before the phone cuts out, and that's the last we hear from Brody. Brody. Oh, fuck. Brody. Jesus. Michael Abaka did a incredible job playing Brody, so hats off to him, and I'm so sorry if I just butchered that pronunciation. Looking over at Finley, we can see that she is now clearly broken, flicking her lighter on and off, saying that none of it matters anymore, and that Brody was always destined to die. What are we there now, Finley? Doesn't it fucking matter? He's dead and you don't think that matters. He was always gonna die. Boy, them always. You see that? Who fucking about with a lakey and pontoons? And without a whole mail. What's new pals turn into monsters? 
never once, never fucking once, have we tried to do what needed to be done. Finley tells Kaz that she is going to end this and runs off with her lighter. I'm ending this. No, come back. Finley! Kaz chases after her. Or you don't, because she'll kindly wait for you because there's no mission fail here. While chasing her, a bit of the rig falls apart and she's caught mangled in debris. And it's here where Finley asks Kaz one very important question. Kaz, I'm here. Finley, I'm here. Kaz, what? Who is it you hear? What is close? Who do I hear? I hear my wife. This confirms it. Finley hearing her son, O'Connor's asking for his wife, and Kaz seeing flashbacks of Sue and hearing her voice. All while that oily biomass is affecting the side of the screen and your face. The sad truth is, Kaz was never just having these visions. It was the monster, the parasite. The minute that explosion went off, the truth is that they were all infected, monster or not. They were all truly doomed from the start. Finley tells Kaz what needs to be done, and for once in Kaz's life, he seems to man up, stand up, and face it. We're not seeing them again, Kaz. There's got to be a shit coming. You, you said it yourself. Christ, Kaz. We don't want them coming. Oh, Jesus! I'm sorry, Father. I don't know what to do. We're going to face it, Kaz. What do you mean? Ah! We can't get back. We can't. That can't. What? There's no going to stop with us. Fuck's sake, McCleary. For once they're alive. Be brave. Be brave for them. You can't save yourself. But you can't save them. Jesus, Finlay. You want to leave it a chance? Oh. It gets to the mainland. Oh, you know I'm right. I'm always fucking right. Oh Christ! Christ! <laughs> all right. Die. All right. For them. Approaching the growth, Sue's voice is louder now than ever, and you can see the growth pulsing. Standing by the ledge, Kaz drops the lighter whilst it's lit, and then the screen goes white. We're greeted with a trio of flashbacks, the first one being Kaz meeting Sue for the first time in a while, which is what I assume got them together. Kaz even mentions Roy. Is that you? The very same. Christ, Kaz, but you look no different. I've still got the nose, eh? <laughs> well, looks like someone did a good job of spreading it about your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, with a big man a drink. We hear Kaz say how much he loves Suze and how he wants to marry her. Consider? Marry me. What? I'm serious. Marianne. Swimming to the top of the bright light, Kaz wakes up in what I can assume is his bed, in the same room we watched all the flashbacks. Suze is laying next to you, and you can even see pictures of what I assume is Kaz on the wall. Opening the door, you say goodbye to Suze to take off for the oil rig once more. Kiss the wings for me. Tell them I'll be back for Christmas. I'm sorry, Suze. And you agree with that cold, deep, unforgiving ocean, and the game's credits roll. Hey, Kaz. I'm sorry it's been so hard. I just wanted to send you this. To say we'll get through it. I know we will. Just take care out there and bring my beautiful big gallus man back home in one piece, okay? I miss you and I love you. And the girls miss and love you. I'm still raging at Roy, but 
He's a good man, and I know he'll look after you. Whatever happens, we will be all right. We can weather this. Just wanted to say that to you, Gas. To keep you safe and close and make sure you know to come home to us. I love you, Cameron McCleary. Be safe out there on those waters. My man. My love. The end monologue is extremely powerful and it's a welcome addition to the game's ending. It's a perfect way to come full circle and wrap up Kaz and Sue's relationship in a perfect way. I can only hope that Suze will find out that Kaz, in his last moments, didn't run away, but ran towards the issue. Now, before I say anything else, I just want to say a massive thank you to Kaz's voice actor, Alec Newman, as well as Karen Dunbar, who played Finlay. And for that matter, the whole cast, because they all did an incredible job. Now, before I give the game its final score and my conclusion on the game and my final thoughts, I need to talk about one very important thing. I need to talk about the game's music. Because the music in Still Wakes the Deep is superbly put together, with the somber moments sounding somber. Sad moments hitting hard. Don't leave me here. Please, back mine. Come on, back Christ, don't leave me. And the horror sections feeling intense, all thanks to the excellent music. I don't really even know how to word this, but the music for the game is just so perfect. It's exactly what I'd envision when I think of a horror game set on an oil rig. For some reason, it's just so perfect and it hits so hard. To put it simply, the game's music is masterfully put together and excellent addition to the game. Now sadly, I do have to talk about some problems that I have with the game, but don't worry, none of them are story or narrative related. And while the gameplay is simple, to me, that's what the game was trying to do. It wasn't trying to be some AAA massive system Elden Ring type game, so the gameplay is not a problem with me either. However, I did encounter some bugs whilst playing. My game crashed once and then I had a few other glitches. Thankfully, the only major bug I had with the game was the crash, which is such a shame because other than that, I had no major bugs with the game. I had things clipping in and out of each other and little things like the phone would clip to the side or like rapid movements, but nothing bad. Other than the crash itself, the game run absolutely fine. Oh, except this other soft lock that completely screwed my game because it like stopped me from swimming it was so annoying there's a gap you have to fit through and it, it just fucking wouldn't let me go through okay i need to talk about one last thing before my conclusion the game's difficulty options allow you to pick between two different difficulties the first one being standard which is basically just your run-of-the-mill normal and the second one being story focused which is well story focused and easier gameplay standard is fair and balanced and story feels like they give you just a little bit of extra time to make decisions and quick time events and things like that there's also a lot of brightness settings still wakes the deep is an incredible game, with well-written and interesting story, fantastic and compelling characters, and a beautiful setting and art style. The characters are masterfully written, and the music is masterfully crafted. To put it bluntly, the gameplay is simple, but simple in a good way, simple in a fun way. The puzzles and parkour feel fun and satisfying, and the horror sections feel intense and gripping. The two major bugs I experienced did not take away from the overall experience, and any other bugs I experienced were very trivial. Trivial. Is, that's that's what I meant. To put it simply, Still Wakes the Deep is an incredible linear action and story focused horror game. And you know what? That is absolutely and completely fine. IGM wrote quite a nasty review on this game, saying it was far too linear, but I think we, as fans of the gaming industry, have forgotten what games are about. Games that I really enjoy, like Still Wakes the Deep, like Hellblade 2, have been shunted and shat on just because they're linear experiences. The sad issue with games nowadays is that they're so oversaturated, so large that gamers have become too custom to that. And even large open world games that are good, people have become custom to that being the thing that should be expected. Well, not me. I'm completely and utterly fine with Still Wakes the Deep being a linear experience. Still Wakes the Deep's gameplay is very simple, to put it bluntly. It is simple, the puzzles are simple, the parkour is simple, and the horror elements can be simple. But it's still extremely fun, extremely satisfying, the music goes hard, and the story is so compelling. I really struggled with 
of giving this game a final ranking, a final score. In fact, it's the last part of the video I'm recording. Well, that does kind of make sense. It's the last part of the video. Part of me wanted to give this game a six because, you know, when you look at the grand scale of games out there, there's so many big, massive open world games. And when you look at horror games, especially, Still Wakes the Deep isn't an incredible horror experience. Then I thought about whether I should give it an eight and really push it up to that status of being an incredible story experience with some of the best voice acting I've ever heard in gaming, hands down. But I realized the bugs I experienced, really, I shouldn't allow that. So my final ultimate review of Still Wakes the Deep, I'm going to be giving it a seven out of 10. So that does it. That does this incredibly long and in-depth review of Still Wakes the Deep. If you've made it this far to the end of this video, I would really appreciate a like and a subscribe and to hit the bell as well. Thank you guys ever so much for watching and I hope you'd enjoy.